the Stuka, the dive bomber whose mere sound put fear into the hearts of thousands. It is one of the most recognized and iconic aircraft of World War II. But in this video, we will look at some of the fascinating details that often get forgotten. The facts and stories that many have never even heard. So here are five things you likely never knew about the Ju-87 Stuka. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what would it have been like to be on the battlefield in one of these famous machines of war? Well, thanks to this video's sponsor, World of Tanks, you don't have to ask anymore. World of Tanks is a free-to-play game that puts you right into the greatest battles of history in more than 600 different tanks. I've been playing some lately in my free time, and trust me, you have to give it a try. It is a ton of fun and the graphics are outstanding. And if you download World of Tanks at the link below and use promo code TANKMANIA, you will get the Excelsior, 250k credits, and 7 days premium access, plus 10 free battles in 3 elite tanks, the Tiger 131, the Cromwell B, or the T-34-85M. But this is only for new players who register for the first time on the Wargaming portal, so don't wait. Right after this video, download World of Tanks today and head to the battlefield. Use the link below and code TANKMANIA to sign up. You are sure to love it. Now, without further ado, enjoy. To start the list for today, we will look at a fairly unknown incident that happened with the Ju-87 and how it was actually one of the most disastrous displays in aviation history. With the looming sense that war was on the horizon, the need for innovative and effective aircraft was clear. The dive bomber, one of the most common aircraft used in the conflict, was constructed to be a radical airplane for launching pinpoint attacks from the air. This particular dive bomber, the Ju-87, or Stuka, was developed to plunge straight towards the ground at a sharp sloping dive, and once it reached the low elevation near a target, the pilot would release one or several bombs before pulling back up to a higher altitude. It was, however, considered by many to be a less than ideal airplane, lacking the speed and finesse that many of the more modern aircraft had. But the Stuka still managed to capture the attention and support of a few favored appreciators in the Luftwaffe. To gain further support for using this aircraft in the impending conflict, a demonstration for the Luftwaffe commanders was arranged to establish the Stuka's revolutionary automatic pull-up dive brakes located beneath either wing of the aircraft, which would function even if the pilot passed out under the strain of the high levels of G-forces from their dive. This display was scheduled for the morning of April 15th of 1939 at a testing range on the outskirts of present-day Poland. Here, 13 Ju-87 Stukas were selected to show their automated decelerating system in front of a select crowd of officers and pilots. On the planned day of this exhibition, however, there was a heavy cloud cover lurking over the intended targets. The meteorological station at the facility gave the pilots an all-clear though, noting that the cloud cover was nothing to be concerned about with the mist breaking at about 2,500 feet above the ground. Leading the way for the demo was Captain Hoffmann Rudolf Braun, a champion of the Stuka and a respected member of the German Air Corps. With a quick command, he and the other two-man crews took to their airplane and launched into the sky. The plan for the presentation was to show the observers on the ground a standard manner of attack. The aircraft would perform a precise dive, drop the bombs onto situated targets, and then pull back up into the sky. The Luftwaffe command watched as the aircraft sped into the air and, upon reaching their desired altitude, dove downwards towards the ground in an attack. The dive was led by one of the secondary pilots, Hauptmann Walter Seigel of Staffel 2, leaving Braun and his Staffel 1 behind to watch the disastrous event that would come next. Seigel dove through the clouds, flanked by his two wingmen, plummeting as they prepared to release their bombs, followed closely by the rest of the flight. As they roared downward though, instead of the mist breaking at 2,500 feet, the cover only cleared when the Stukas were about 300 to 600 feet above the ground. This made it nearly impossible for the pilots to adequately recover from their dives. 
Seigel pulled up as fast as he was able to, barely recuperating in time to return to the air. His two wingmen, however, were unable to recover and smashed into the ground, killing the four crewmen instantly. Eleven other Stukas, all of whom had tried to recover in their own dives, were unable to pull up and crashed, killing another 22 men, leaving the Luftwaffe with a total of 26 airmen dead, 13 destroyed Stukas, and horrified witnesses on the ground. Braun, who had been alerted to the disaster by Seigel, managed to protect his own squadron from diving, but could do nothing but watch in horror. Until the Battle of Britain, this would be the worst single-day losses for the Stuka, but incredibly, it did not take away from the popularity of the Ju-87 among the Luftwaffe. Seigel was cleared of any responsibility for the crash and was made commander of the Luftwaffe in Norway during the war and would be active at this post until his death in 1944. Up next at number 4, we will review the first time that the Ju-87 was used in World War II and its very first losses in the conflict. On September 1st of 1939, just shy of 4.30 a.m., three Stukas departed from an airbase in eastern Prussia to strike an electric station located in a regularly contested region between Germany and Poland. A long railway bridge connected the German and Polish sides to one another, and the Germans wanted to keep it intact for their upcoming advance. With a signal from the lead pilot, the Stukas announced their dive with a shriek of their sirens, accurately dropping several 250 kilogram bombs onto the station. This became the first target for the German offensive, announcing the start of the war, taking place just 11 minutes before the official declaration was made by Hitler. Polish military engineers, though, raced to the bridge, knowing that the invasion was imminent and quickly demolished it to protect Poland from the incoming trains of German troops. While the Polish army engineers hurried to handle the bridge, more Stukas were then launched to bomb a peacetime airfield, but found it deserted because the Polish Air Force had moved their military targets to a secluded and secret base in the countryside. These bases would be quickly discovered, and as they were discovered, two Polish fighters tried to quickly scramble and get in the air. The lead Stuka pilot, Captain Frank Neubert, shot down the first of them, a Polish captain, as he tried to get in the air. This would go down as the first aerial victory of the war, by a Ju-87 Stuka. Shortly thereafter, a vanguard of Stukas was sent to attack the Polish Navy at the Hela Naval Base, with four Stukas diving down from nearly 23,000 feet. Here they were met by heavy anti-aircraft fire, and two of them were knocked out of the sky. These two Ju-87s and their crew would go down as the first German casualties of the war. These attacks were the very first action in World War II, and the Ju-87 was undoubtedly the star in breaking open the greatest conflict in world history. For our next point, we will cover the impressive death tally of the most skilled Stuka pilot in history. This would be none other than the infamous Hans Ulrich Rudel. Rudel was a skilled pilot and would go down as quite possibly the most lethal ground attack aviator of all time. His accomplishments in the war are too lengthy to list in their entirety, but we can cover some of the highlights. Early on in his career, for example, Rudel would make a name for himself after the sinking of a Soviet battleship named Marat, nearly by himself. Following this, his career took off. In the early years of the war, he continued to destroy enemy targets all across the Eastern Front, but then, in 1943, he began to utilize a new tactic in the Ju-87, a tank buster. This would see his aircraft outfitted with cannons underneath the wings for low-level strafing instead of the traditional dive bombing. This is where he would hit his full stride, attacking tanks from the air with incredible success. Utilizing this new approach to Ju-87 warfare, he would outlast most of the other Stuka pilots who saw high losses in the later years of the war. By the time the Germans surrendered in 1945, he was one of the only Ju-87 pilots left and had amassed more than 2,500 combat missions, where he claimed 500 tanks destroyed, 
three major Soviet warships sunk, 70 landing craft destroyed, and over 150 pieces of Soviet artillery that had met their demise at the end of his guns. Even more incredibly, he was also credited with nine air-to-air -air kills and was shot down or forced to crash land roughly 30 times from damage received in combat. His effectiveness on the Eastern Front was so infamous that it earned Rudel a 100,000 ruble bounty put on his head by Joseph Stalin himself. At number two, we will look at the immortality of the legendary Stuka dive siren. The noise of the Stuka is one of the most famous features of the aircraft, announcing an attack with a deafening shill cry to strike fear and panic as the airplane dove to drop bombs or lay down fire upon enemy targets. These Jericho trumpets became the sound of war, a blaring and thunderous cry that would pierce the air before the bomber swung into position. This screaming was featured heavily during the Battle of Britain and became synonymous with the scenes of attacking aircraft. Over these months, many in England would run for cover at the sound of the Stuka sirens, retreating into bunkers and the darkness of their bomb shelters to hide from the incoming attacks. And even though the Stuka would be the only aircraft ever outfitted with this infamous feature, its effect and legend would long outlive the service life of the actual aircraft. Following the Second World War, the siren of the Stuka has been indiscriminately used by sound mixers in film and television to highlight the terrifying noise of war, even though this has been inaccurate in many productions. With a simple look, viewers can often notice audio producers slapping the Stuka siren onto any and all diving aircraft. This can be heard clearly in various dramas or even more commonly animated shows like the Looney Tunes or even modern day cartoons. Finally, for our last fact, we will take a look at the surviving Stukas still in existence today. As of 2023, there are only two fully intact Stukas preserved from the Second World War. This is because many were scrapped for parts as the faster and more mobile models were the priority, with Germany scrambling to try and survive the last year of the war. Today, at the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry, viewers can see a bullet-riddled 1941 JU-87 Tropical Stuka that was retrieved by the British from an airfield in Libya during the North African campaign. After the war, the Stuka was brought and later donated to the United States. The second Stuka, the only fully intact and close to airworthy JU-87, can be seen at the Royal Air Force Museum in London. This aircraft was captured from a German airbase in 1945 by the advancing Allied forces and was eventually selected to be preserved in a British museum. It has not flown for decades, but it was, in the late 1960s, selected for use in the famous movie The Battle of Britain. In this picture that would go on to become an iconic wartime cinema, the aircraft was originally supposed to be used for real scenes in the air. The crews had little difficulty in starting the engine, which was found to be in pristine condition. However, after it was started up, crews decided that it would be too expensive of a project to undertake, and so the Stuka never left the ground. It still rests at the museum today, ready to fly if someone can create the budget to do so. There is, however, one more JU-87 that is being assembled by a private collector. This one is being put together from two different aircraft wrecks by the famous Flying Heritage and Combat Armor Museum. There is no recent update, but hopefully, someday, one of these beautiful warbirds will once again take to the skies. For now, though, we can only look up and imagine. Please comment on what plane I should cover next, and please consider subscribing.